different time today. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, if you're in this room, odds are you're a farmer or somebody who's actually interested in the real, like, doing it in the fields. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about theory. We're going to talk about practical stuff. Um, my name is Derek Christensen. I'm a vegetable grower in southeastern Massachusetts at Briggs County Farm. I've been growing vegetables commercially uh, for a little over 15 seasons in North in New England. Uh, before I started our farm, I farmed in Poplar Valley in New York, a uh, mixed biodynamic vegetable farm, uh, farmed on Martha's Vineyard, where my wife is from. And uh, we started Bridge Stunning Farm about eight or nine years ago in Dartmouth. There were a couple of reasons um, we landed there, but one of the goals was to scale our farm at a scale that allows me to not have to do too much administration. So I get to have my hands in the dirt, get to be in the fields on a regular basis. I try to get out of the office as much as possible. Um, so we, you know, by that kind of defined our scale. We weren't going to be 20 acres of veg where I need to be an HR person more than a farmer. Um, so we crop seven acres of vegetables currently. Um, the other thing that kind of was the vision is when I was at Hopper Valley, I didn't really like to live in a truck. They drive veggies far, far away, so the goal was in the universe of places to say, try and find a place where you can sell your produce as close to the farm as possible. And so um, we market about 95% of our veggies right from the farm through an honor system roadside stand that's open right now. Uh, so theoretically, we're selling vegetables today. Um, and a CSA that runs in the summertime and in the wintertime as well. Uh, and then we do one farmer's market that I've always called kind of a social outlet market. It's not... Um, Let's go make a ton of money. Uh, although this year with the HIP program in Massachusetts, it became a little bit more of a viable market. And that's in New Bedford, which is about five minute drive from the farm. Um, so we were uh, talking a little bit this summer with Dan and I, and, and he had invited me to do a workshop. And I said, well, I, you know, I'd like to talk about nitrogen because um, maybe it's it's this like seen as this evil to be adding nitrogen. But as a commercial grower, it seems to be for me a necessity um, if we want to ensure really good yields in a timely fashion. And I wanted to get into that conversation a little bit. And um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a lot about what we do on our farm, uh, what we've seen as the impacts. Um, I'd like the conversation, I, I kind of told myself, I'd like it to be not just a monologue. I want it to be a little bit more of a conversation today. Um, so sometimes we ask to hold the questions, but today I'd like to invite folks, if there's times when we're talking, if there's a question that comes up that's pertinent to the conversation right then and there, to jump in and, and let's kind of jump into that space. Because the goal of this is not to say that, you know, this is the only knowledge in the room. It's, it's trying to build uh, from the community as a whole. Does that make sense? <laughs> so uh, just kind of give me a sense of the room. Uh, scale of growers here. How many folks are commercial vegetable farmers? Maybe about half. And uh, people cropping, say, less than two acres, micro farm scale. Quite a few people cropping my scale, like say two to ten acres. And anybody doing more than ten? All right. Um, I'm going to continue just to get a sense of how many people use compost quite a lot. Right. You've got right. a category. How many right. people are cropping grass? Hey, hey, farms. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. If there's anybody else that wants to jump into that conversation, so um, are you like landscaper, landscaper? <clears throat> Maintaining properties, that kind of stuff? Yes, on a very small scale. Yeah, but uh, understand in why lawns were collapsing is what brought me into the arena about two years ago. Great. Um, yeah, how many folks are using compost as a major source of fertility on the farm? So quite a few. How many people don't use compost on the farm? So we're going to be in a unique minority, and I talk about why we're at that situation where we are, um, and it's not because I think compost is a bad situation. Um, how many folks are? What's your definition? Uh, some material that's been digested through microbial processes for a period of time. Is that a fair definition. Um, so I'm a mushroom farmer, so I'm. A Great. <laughs> so, I'm yeah, if you, if you, and you might get into the conversation there where you have it as a resource for the community and there's things that you can do to make that compost maybe even better, which is one of the reasons why we don't use compost in our farm is because we don't have anybody in our neighborhood that's making really good compost except for on a you know, small scale. Uh, how many folks are importing nitrogen on an annual basis on their vegetable farm right now? 
And if you want to just popcorn, like, what you're using or what kinds of things. Yes. Prayer, so compost and chicken manure. Fish emulsion. Fish emulsion from Neptune's Arms Organic Gem. Seed meal. Seed meal, like soybean meal, that kind of stuff. Cotton seed meal. Cotton seed meal. And pro grow is another blended. Yeah, all those good stuff. Fancy bags. I'm moving away from the uh, compost spreads to more of the uh, uh, probiotic formula. Uh, fertilizers. All right, so um, let me just give you a quick overview of the conversation we're going to try to have. Um, it's not a PowerPoint intensive presentation. I sort of thought about it and said, no, I just put together a bunch of photos from this growing season. So if you want to look at some photos, we can look at some photos. I have a handout and we're going to do some worksheets. Um, the goal is to talk a little bit about um, why I've gotten to where I've gotten with nitrogen. Uh, my experiences there on our farm, I really want to dissect the growing season and get a good understanding of this idea that soil is much different on November 28th than it's on June 15th or it's on August 15th. And if we're vegetable growers where we have the capacity to micromanage fertility, we often will make different decisions based on where we're at in the growing season, the same way they make different decisions based on what crop we're growing or what the situation of the past history has been in our soils. So that's going to be you know, a bulk of our conversation. We're going to run through some nitrogen budgets. So we can kind of look at, you know, if this is how much nitrogen we need, where are we going to get it from? Um, and then uh, if we have time, which we should, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, these different products and why we might want to choose one or the other. Um, a couple things just briefly about the farm real quick, um, just to give you more background. Uh, so we're in coastal southeastern Massachusetts. Um, I have a, a link to a temperature map here, which is always kind of fun. And I'll throw that up for a second. Um, so this is from the Cornell website that gives you two-inch soil temperature, presumably it's some sort of satellite information. And uh, we are located down here. Um, so you can see our soil temperature is still in the mid-40s. We've had two bouts of 19 degree nights, but um, we were digging potatoes because uh, we haven't got all our field work done. We were digging potatoes on Monday, um, harvesting lettuce that was under row cover. We are in a sheltered microclimate. Um, if you look at this map in May and June, what you see is the inverse. You see soil temperatures are quite compressed in the coastal environment. We get these coastal breezes, and a lot of times our daytime temperatures in May might be stuck in the 50s and low 60s when we get an ocean breeze, where if we go 30 miles inland, it might be in the high 70s. Um, so a lot of what's informed our practices is our specific growing conditions, and I think that's going to be true for every you know, farm operation. Um, as I mentioned, we market stuff, you know, hyper locally. We do a lot of things different than uh, a lot of our neighbors, and it's not necessarily for any uh, reason other than that we're just kind of finding our path. Um, but among the, among the things that we do differently is I don't staff our farm stand, I don't staff our CSA distribution, and um, it's primarily because I realize I like growing food. I don't like necessarily having to just sit there and talk to people. Why did you eat my food? I want to have that taken care of either ahead of time or if people say, oh, I want to go get that food because it's done. And if people want like the hunky-dory experience of me and the farmer, well, like, you know, we'll have some events over the course of the season. Um, but part of the vision, and it's worked out quite well, is, you know, I wanted our farm to grow food that would feed the community. And, you know, it, it happens to me all the time. Like I'm at my daughter's school and the principal comes up and is like, who I've never really interacted with whatsoever. She's like, oh, you know, we love stopping at your farm stand. It's like, I've never even seen you there because I'm not there. And um, what that reality is, is, I also talk a lot about finances, is I think as a lot of small farmers, we need to do a good job making sure we're charging for the marketing costs that are associated with our, with our food. And, you know, if you go to a farmer's market and you don't have a full bounty and it's not a big market, it's a really expensive way to spend your time. Um, so we've sort of gone into this uh, honor system marketing because it allows us to be out in the field. Um, it uh, also allows us to have a really small staff. Um, we do our seven acres with three full-time people and a couple part-timers in the summer. Uh, this year, I thought I was being smart because I wanted to raise wages, so I decided I was going to delay uh, hiring folks this year. I said, well, I'll wait and I'll bring somebody on May 1st. And um, push come to shove, we didn't identify the right people until the fifth of June. Um, so this was a really kind of fun growing season because I got to shelve all the teaching that I used to do and just farm. I was all by myself. 
Uh, I had one farm, you know, helper come out one day a week up until about the 5th of June, which is not recommended. <laughs> um, it, it made for a somewhat stressful start to the growing season, but it was sort of corresponding with the fact that we had a really cool spring, and I wasn't, you know, out there planting up to abundance. Uh, you know, we didn't put onions in the ground until early May, so on and so forth. Um, but my background in Holland Valley, we grow 10 acres, it's more of a larger scale, like we get on a job and we do it fast. Um, so our farm is, even though we're not that big, we're really trying to be efficient at the task that we do so that we can also do the things that are considered to be not so efficient, which is like spreading minerals by hand, so on and so forth. Uh, final thing, um, I support our family with the farm. My wife raises our three kids. She does like a lion's share of that world of things. Um, she doesn't work on the farm principally. And so a lot of the decisions that I make have the bottom line as a really um, big deciding factor. So, questions a little bit about Brick Stony Farm, anything? Oh, I want to say one more thing about organic, yeah. Have you any um, turns any losses with your honor system? Yeah, we have quite a bit of that, and we're still trying to figure out how we want to deal with that. We don't um, have cameras set up for it. Um, <coughs> that tends to be from a certain part of the community that's often like three or four bags of produce with five dollars put in a box. Um, kind of go back and forth because I really don't like the idea of having to videotape people. We might end up going that direction. Um, this year sort of worked out the landowners were selling some pumpkins and some neighboring sweet corn. So there was a little bit of like monitoring in the farm stand. But the reality is like in the summertime we're open at you know six or seven in the morning and they're closed down at nine o'clock at night. Part of the idea behind that system is that you know I don't like the idea that you can only go to a farmer's market for four hours of the day out of one day of the week, and you know, I, I, our lives are busy as heck. And it was uh, visiting Ryan at Red Fire when he was back in Granby like 15 years ago, and I he was out there in January at like 10.30 at night, and there's so many shopping in this little honor system farmstead, I was like, this is great. You know, you can have a life that's not, uh, you know, somebody allows you to go to the market. So um, at this point, the losses are much less than what it would cost to pay somebody. And um, up until this year, we were probably paying more like ag minimum wage. This year, we're paying the state minimum wage for our crew members. But if you know anything about employment laws, uh, if you're selling retail, uh, that's not field work. And so logistically, <laughs> part of the uh, argument for me is I don't want to pay somebody more to work in a farm stand than what we're paying, what we're paying in the field. And so, you know, every year we're bumping up our wages. The goal is, I guess, to get to 50 bucks an hour where everybody's going to have to be in like three or four years. Um, and we can talk about pricing because that's played a role into to maximizing that. And what are those prices for the ag workers? Uh, in Massachusetts, it's eight dollars an hour, and it's eleven dollars an hour for the state minimum wage. Um, there will be a law passed either this year by the state house, or there'll be a referendum on, on that will be fifteen dollars an hour by two thousand twenty-two. Um, and I'm all for paying people well that are like needing the money. Uh, I've been talking a little bit with our local rep and say, you know, the real problem is that we need training wages. Um, because to pay somebody who's you know 18 or 19 and hasn't had a lot of work experience, $50 an hour, it doesn't work on our situation because there's so much training that goes into it. Um, but we've, we decided, hey, let's pay him for a shorter period of time. We gave him less of an educational experience, our crew members this year, because we thought him more as workers. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really open about the economics of the farm, so if there's conversations that go into that as we talk. Um, so building on your farm set, then, how do you... Um, how do you plan out kind of your harvesting for the farm stand? Is like an on need basis, or do you just harvest like once a week, and that's what you have? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, just gonna get out of that picture. I'm not a huge fan of waste, so these are other things we do weird on a farm. We have no refrigeration, um, and we don't use irrigation. So um, the refrigeration, we do CSA distributions Tuesdays and Fridays. Our CSA is not very big; it's about 85 to 90 members. Um, we found over the years the farm stand is just a better way for us to move produce. And then we have a market on Thursdays that historically didn't take everything that we brought to market. So, you know, the reality is on Tuesday and Fridays, we harvest for five or ten extra shares, and all the extra stuff slides over into the farm stand, and then we just augment with what we need. And certainly, like, in the summertime, you know, you're following squash and zucchini and cucumbers on the cycle of when they need to be picked. Um, at this time of year, uh, where it's cooler and you got refrigeration for the farm stand, uh, we're harvesting twice a week, sort of, you know, this is the good day to be outside touching cold vegetables. Uh, and it works out pretty well, and um, boy, 
might not be fair exactly, but you know, I had a little Toyota pickup. I probably filled it three times worth of compost this year um, in terms of stuff that didn't sell. So a lot of things, what we, you know, we don't necessarily bring stuff in and then just watch it not sell. It's like, well, we can wait on something in the field. Um, so, you know, we get by without refrigeration. There are some situations where obviously refrigeration, you know, obviously you don't have to let us before a thunderstorm would make for a better situation, but sometimes we just feel like, oh, let's, you know, that got trashed the other day, let's let it sit for a day or two and then we'll come back to it. And we don't necessarily guarantee having everything all the time, um, but it works out pretty well. Yeah. So, um, final thing is, so I used to be on the NOFA Mass board, I resigned from that last year, my wife has put a stop to all, like, anything not farm related, <laughs> um, it, which just works out well, our kids are getting older and there's more time for all those kinds of things. Um, and Along with that, last year I decided since I wasn't in a box, I've never been certified organic, but I've always followed organic practices, is last year I decided to open that up. And so we've started using conventional fertilizers, and we'll talk about those and the reasons behind that. Um, but I've never been a dogmatic uh, person. So, um, except for, you know, the way we do things now is the way I want to do them, and it might be the way we do them in the future. So, um, in addition to those practices, you know, we don't, as a rule, spray any sort of pesticides, fungicides, that kind of stuff organic or not, uh, we take our lumps, although next year there is a product that I'm going to be using to control pepper maggots because I've decided we take our lumps too many years with pepper maggots. So, all right, um, so the third or fourth season I was farming, I was on the vineyard and uh, farming at Bayes Norton Farm and we were using CPS 5, you know, where the 548, 724, these bag fertilizers. And you know, I didn't have any real concept except for like we put the fertilizer on and help us grow crops. And we bring some compost in from a neighboring forest farm, a sort of nice relationship. Um, but at that point, I started to question this idea of like, well, where does all this bag fertilizer come from? And how sustainable is it? And so on and so forth. <coughs> um, and when I left the vineyard, I took a job at Hoffman Valley Farm. And one of the things that really attracted me to Hoffman Valley was this idea of a closed loop system of biodynamics and this attempt to kind of create this farm organism. And um, what that gave me uh, an understanding of is, is when it's working really well, it can be amazing in its functionality. Um, Hollander Valley at the time, we were milking about 50 dairy cows, three or 400 acres of pastures and hay fields, and that was supporting a market garden that ranged from about eight to 15 acres, depending on how much we had in production. And our main fertility source outside of some lime was the compost created from the cows. And um, it was about that time that I started getting into this conversation about nutritional quality, and there was a year there where we had a lot of problems with brass diseases in the fall, and um, alternaria, so on and so forth, um, cabbages, turnip leaves, things like that. And you know, this was a, the first farm that I'd been at that had been managed kind of organically for more than ten years. So it's sort of like, why aren't we closer to this promised land of you know everything being just bountiful and never having disease and pests? And we got and did a three-day workshop with Neil Kinsey, and he started talking about, um, you know, flavor profiles. If you've ever had a bitter turnip, and I, I said, oh yeah, you know, the first year I farmed, I made this nice roasted vegetable medley from our farm that had potatoes and carrots and beets and turnips. My mom was this in from Minnesota, and I put it on the table, and we we're like, we could eat the turnips. They were like inedible in the level of their bitterness. And Neil was saying, well, you know, if you got that bitter experience in the turnip, you, you got to get balance of potassium, too much potassium. And versus your calcium. I said, oh, I had that experience, you know, five, five, five years ago. And in Hawthorne Valley, I started to realize, in my opinion, in estimation, our compost-based reliance, we weren't doing enough to balance the system. Our potassium levels were getting really high. It allowed us to grow dinner plate-sized broccoli heads, which is kind of fun. Um, but I didn't feel like the quality was always hitting the mark. And when we decided to leave Hawthorne Valley, um, and we started our farm, we moved down to southeastern Massachusetts to be close to family. I said, you know, the goal of the farm is, is sort of threefold. We want to be a catalyst for kind of looking at this idea of quality on the fields. I want to just be out the farm the way I do it. Um, and I really want to figure out, you know, how to do it in whatever we think is a sustainable manner. Um, but I realized that I wasn't going to be a dairy farmer. The economics of dairy farming are really, really, really tough. Anybody's around dairy farming, they understand that very, very well. Um, and although we have a land base now in the current farm to support, say, livestock, from a management principle, I decided that, you know what, like in the wintertime, I like not having to rush out to do chores because it means I get to spend time reading books with my kids in the morning. 
Um, so I, you know, I didn't necessarily feel like I needed to have the all-in-one holistic farm. And so, you know, maybe we're, we're going to extend the borders of what we think of as our traditional farm for bringing in nutrients from that for that for that farm. So, you know, initially we're bringing in some compost from our neighbors. We're using a lot of fish from organic gem down in New Bedford. Um, and then we started using various bags, nitrogen fertilizers to get our growth there. Um, and so, you know, our, our dogma is not, you know, I, I, we still use biodynamic preps and follow certain things within the biodynamic realm of, of thinking, but we're not like this vision of a closed loop system. And it's partially because I decided to make our money growing vegetables and exporting as many of them as I can because that's how I get paid is growing a lot of food on a small space. It's an extractive experience. And over time, my goal is to try to do it in a way that improves the resource base, the land that we grow on for the future generations. Do you use cover crops? We do use cover crops. Yes and no. Which is the yes and which is the no? So the yes is the first year I farmed when we didn't really have a market demand for five acres. We had half the field in hairy vetch, and then we let that vetch go for two seasons. I mowed it. But I mowed it when it was a little bit hard, so next year we had a beautiful stand of vetch again. And I can tell you from a nitrogen perspective, that season equaled the nitrogen that I would work at when I was at Hoffman Valley. It was just fighter power. You know, scallions that were like, you know, like beyond the knee high and looking great. And um, I think a, a complementary system of legumes is probably what is the most responsible way to grow if you don't have access to animal numbers. The reality of our farm is this last year we don't have anything cover crop. Um, there's no real bare soil because we have a lot of weeds at the end of the season. Um, but we've been doing an intense amount of rock work. And so I, I sort of balance with like the time it takes to put the cover crop down and the time it takes to like build you know our soils to be like functional for cultivation and so on and so forth. So we've sort of hit the pause on our cultivation, I mean our cover crops, only just because we haven't figured out our management. Um, which is to say that some years we have a couple acres of cover crops, some years we have three or four. This year I just put a single cover crop seed down. And you know, we had a window and we missed the window and it's like, you know what? Why bother putting something that involves any tillage involved? So um, that being said, with the exception of like where we're harvesting leeks and a few of our lettuce heads, there's nothing that I would be at all concerned about from an erosion standpoint. And from a fertility perspective, we have some excesses that create, you know, a beautiful carpet of chickweed, for example, if anybody gets to experience that. Yeah. When you say we, who does the decision making for the cover crop? Oh, it's all me. Okay. Yeah, we is the universal farm. <laughs> um, this year it's Danny who's, who's at the farm today working with me. Um, Danny came from the chef industry, he lives in New Bedford, and um, by now it's the we is the kind of thing. There's what I know is the best thing to do, and then there's what's the actual reality. And I have it married together is the reality, say, in southeastern Massachusetts, that on September 15th, I can plant a radish seed that brings income in and keeps our farmstand customers very excited to be buying radishes on November 15th. Or I can plant a cover crop. And what we're not always good at is deciding that we're going to take the time to plant a cover crop rather than that radish seed. And so for this year, the way it worked out labor-wise is we cut down to one full-time person because one of our full-time workers was a, was a student. And so we were strapped from labor perspective. The fall was beautiful and warm, and there were tons of vegetables to harvest. And so, you know, push comes to shove. It's always to say, well, what are you going to put your priorities on? You know, I love the Nordell approach where you like put cover crops first and figure out your rotations there. Um, our work this year was like, we did a ton of rock picking this year. It's kind of like our fun hobby activity. We are doing it yesterday. Um, so, and, and I didn't put into the to the vault, but we can talk about cover crops. But in, in my estimation, um, my approach to cover cropping is not to think of it as like ignore it from a fertility perspective. It's to think about how are we gonna maximize this cover crop to do its best. So when we put that vetch down, um, we were hanging out with Dan and, and you know we're spraying cobalt and aluminum and other things that are known to help the legume families fix nitrogen effectively. The nodulation in that batch was as good as I've ever seen it. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's not a, like, let's take a cover crop and ignore that field. It's like, let's take a cover crop and make it better. So our, you know, our summer cover crops on our farm are sweet corn and beans, um, which are two crops that I don't think are economical to grow on a commercial scale. But it's like, well, if we're gonna grow 
some sweet corn, and let's just try and feed it so we can get really good sized stock, or let that stock get a little more carbonaceous, so we're gonna have an effect of a, of a cover crop in terms of biomass production, but also get a crop that gives our CSA members the experience of having sweet corn, um, so on and so forth. Um, so over the years, we've kind of ebbed and flowed in terms of what our nitrogen sources were. Um, but the economics, and, and I'm going to do a, a handout in a second, but we found that we need to have a certain level of production at a certain time. Later. And climatically speaking, in southeastern Massachusetts, we are often in the 50s, soil temperature-wise, in May. And if we want to be planting and really getting stuff to grow, we need to kind of make sure that the gas pedal is there and it's available. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing some pictures so you can see a few things from the vegetable season this year. Um, and then we're talking about the actual nitty-gritty of nitrogen bubbles. Does that make sense? So um, we may or may not be able to use the clip. We're going to find out. So uh, these are, I just went through my all my photos from last year and tried to pick out some nice pictures of vegetables. Um, and I have to figure out a if this is not going to allow me to pause it for a second, for a second. Oops. Again. These are Hawkeye turnips. These were harvested, I think, on the 3rd of January at the beginning of this year out of our high tunnel. Um, so last year we had a really mild December and allowed us to produce roots. These were seeded on uh, probably, I think, like October 18th last winter. Um, so that was the advantage of that. So we're going to go through the growing season. Um, what I want to emphasize here is we think a little bit about plants and really to start internalizing the, I want to figure out a way to make this pause. We're going to try again, different program. Yeah, if you want to forward and backwards, that'd be helpful. Sorry about that. Makes sense? Um, so you can go ahead and go forward. What I want to stress in this is the idea that you know, our tomato seedling has a much different nitrogen need than our tomato plant in July and August. <clears throat> and we need to think about that as we approach our fertility program from a, from a balanced perspective. We're not having a meal that's going to feed everything. So you know, we're using Vermont uh, ProGrow, I mean uh, Vermont <laughs> Compost, the really like kicking soil mix, right? Um, gives us great seedlings. This one might be flushing a little bit of uh, iron issues just because we're playing around with it. You can go forward. Um, we're not doing anything really dramatically different with our seedling production, uh, except that we use the hose-on injector to be able to um, add some minerals. Really easy way to do that. Uh, it does limit you in terms of the pressure output, so it might slow your watering down a little bit. But it allows us, if we want to put some liquid cal or some sea minerals down, uh, we don't have to spend time spraying it. We can just use a little siphon. Uh, those hose-on siphons are nice. Uh, we are transplanting everything by hand. We tend to transplant things when they're young. Um, and so our starts are in the greenhouse for as short a period of time as possible to give them a nice root ball. That's the ideal. Um, we have a lot of flexibility there. Over the years, I've realized you can put some pretty crummy transplants in the ground and enjoy some crops. You'll see some pictures of that. Um, go ahead. These are a little bit out of order because decided to rearrange it when we went into this program. Uh, this is potatoes, you know, a couple weeks after emergence. Again, thinking about the nitrogen need of this small plant versus when it's bulking that tuber up. Go ahead. Uh, the lighting is a little bit weird, but uh, who grows panisse lettuce? Who, who's ever not tried it and maybe thinks they need to find a new lettuce to grow? We hit, Dan was just talking about the monkey, like the 100 monkey critical mass. We hit a, a point this year where all of a sudden, like, that's what people want. And, I mean, we're now growing probably next year. I don't want to get too sold on it, but probably 40% of our lettuce in the summer will be panisse. Because people would just come up and be like, oh, where's the panisse? Can you spell it? Yeah. It's P-A-N-I-S-S-E. Um, High mowing has another variety that's in that same category, um, depending on the name of it. Uh, but it's got a bib texture. Fills out this beautiful head, and for whatever reason, um, the customers at our farm stand decided it was the best lettuce in the world this year, and they liked it 
when, when I first was told about it, it was Jim Buckle who farms up in May down and he was growing for restaurants, and I said, oh, that's not shishi, you had a lettuce, I'm not going to grow panisse. And then we started growing it and realizing that people love it, and it's like, okay, count the masses. Um, so this is uh, lettuce in, in June, you know, about 10 days before it's going to get cut. Go ahead. Um, oh, yeah, our head lettuce. So part of our idea to raise price uh, raise prices is to pay our employees better. Right. Um, so this year we bumped our prices up to 350 on heads of lettuce that were in prime condition, like more than a pound of lettuce or like, you know, things like this. You can get two pound heads of two star in the height of the season. Uh, and next year we'll put the panisse at four bucks no matter what. Um, and there's absolutely no concern during the peak part of our season where we have a lot of customers uh, paying that price. Um, the quality is excellent. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, we get complaint. In fact, historically I've, I've shied away from mini heads because I, I felt like there is too much work. But we get complaints from a lot of our older customers that our heads of lettuce are too big. And normally we cut lettuce mix so they can, oh, get a bag of lettuce mix instead. We'll probably bring back some mini romains next year just to, to suit that clientele. Because you know, people will get you know a big head of lettuce in August and be like, oh, so we, you know, and somebody literally said, well, the head of feed like a you know family of sixteen. Um, and it's partially because people are used to not eating vegetables, right? They're like three leaves of lettuce on a plate, and I'm like so full. Um, you didn't you didn't use mulch? No, no mulch. So uh, these guys, our standard lettuce prices are three bucks a head. Yeah, and uh, next year we're gonna. See if we can sell panisas at four dollars a head. Because why not? Can you do any selling of them? Uh, no. Although this year we, I brought, haven't grown them in three or four years. It's kind of ho ho on them. We we grow our salad mix as we three four seeds per cell. We transplant. We grow juvenile lettuce mix. That was sort of like what Salanova is. Um, and I just didn't feel like the Salanova gave me the bulk that I wanted with my traditional lettuce mix side. I don't grow a mess of mix. I don't grow fancy vegetables. Panisa is as fancy as it gets. Um, but I am, we've raised prices this year, we've tested prices, so we can try and figure out, and I tried to, like with our CSA members, I raised prices, I told them, well, this is the reason, we want to pay our farmers better. And the reality of our life is it's very labor intensive. Try to go ahead. Which one is this right there? Uh, that's two star or Burgum's Green, I can't say with certainty. Um, but we grow, yeah. I'm gonna do a workshop all on lettuce at the CMAP conference in February, if anyone is available to Southeastern Massachusetts. All right, so this is an important picture. Um, so that's kale, and I looked back, at that photo was taken on April 17th, and that kale was planted on April 14th. So this is three days in the field. And um, this is how I got into thinking about nitrogen, was when we started to kind of take an approach where we're looking at fertility and really making sure that everything was there on the table for the plants, we realized that when we put plants in the ground, there was an amazing rooting energy that was taken. As soon as you put things in the ground, I tell people, like 24 to 48 hours, I want to see that explosion of new root growth. And if you understand that what roots are doing is they're seeking calcium, so you have a good available calcium level, and they're going to go out and do that. And what we noticed probably four or five years ago is that anytime we went out and transplanted in April and May into cool soils, we put the plant in the ground, and three or four days later, you saw this growth, and the cotyledons or the seed leaves would turn yellow. Has anybody experienced this? Mm -hmm. Logically, what's happening is the plant is deciding that it needs to grow roots. In order to do that, it needs nitrogen, right? Because nitrogen is in every single cell of the plant. And if it can't get it from the soil because it's not available, it's going to take it out of the leaf. So over the years, we've gone to a starter fertilizer when we transplant, especially in the springtime, that involves some soluble nitrogen. It's not the idea that we're going to go out and put on so much nitrogen that the plant's going to become this lush like growth right through the growing season. It's the idea that on that day, on April 14th, we happened to hit this, it was cool spring, but we had like this little warm Easter this year. Um, so, and this was under row cover, uh, which you probably see a picture of in a second. So there was some, like a little bit of warmth going on there, but the soils were not warm this year. But we want, the idea is that, you know, the sun's shining, it's April, it's May, it's June. We want to maximize that solar gain for our plant so that we can grow as big of a plant as possible. And ideally, the plant grows a really good root system and puts a lot of biomass and fun stuff down into the root system. So questions about this? We'll talk about the recipe in a second, but go ahead and go. There's a few more photos. Um, do, you use, do you use a transplant solution? 
<laughs> we used to, um, and now we sort of like do some field sprays sometimes. Hip transplant solutions are great. Sometimes it's a nice way to do it. We just dip them. We'd have a, the same seeding trough that we use for other things in the farm. Yeah. Um, it's this year. The only thing we did with that was I was spraying nematodes for alliums, and we often will drench our flats with that right before we transplant. Um, but yeah, over the years, some years we've done more, some years we've done less. That time of year is you know we didn't have a lot of labor, so we were doing the bare minimum. So <clears throat> Uh, it was often a little bit of fish, which some people would complain about your hands smelling a little bit. Uh, some liquid kelp, uh, and typically a little bit of these, you know, fancy rock mineral type things. But you just said when you were transplanting that kale, you did something prior, or made sure you gave them a little food right in that window. No, that field got uh, just our fertility starter program, which I talked about. Yeah, we're talking about. It. Uh, these photos are completely out of order. I tried to arrange them, but this is a photo from uh, September 16th. Those are late greens, uh, lettuce mix, uh, Carlton Asian greens, which puts on biomass better than anything, pak choy, really young mustards. Uh, we keep our fields clean when, it, when we need to. Go ahead, go forward. There are some pictures. That's, that's a week later. Same photo, just a little bit off. You can now get some other things in there, but you can see those guys just started to harvest the Carltons. Maybe we can turn the light off for a second. You said no irrigation. No, but certainly in the fall, that's not an issue. We had a, a wet fall. Um, but yeah, we don't irrigate. Part of that irrigation is that plants really, a lot of the water they use is, you know, how much of it's used for photosynthesis? People, anybody, scientists in the room? Yes? Yeah. You haven't heard me talk about this number? <clears throat> What's the number? So what time? How much is water is used for photosynthesis in plants? What was that guess? 5%. That's a good guess. It's like generally less than 3, 2%. Most of what the water is being used by the, for the plant is to exchange at the leaf surface to bring carbon dioxide and to move nutrients around. So if we can create better sap pressure so we can move nutrients around well, so every time the water is moving, it's moving like a bunch of good stuff. Um, and we do a better job with our photosynthetic efficiency, we can grow crops with a lot less water. Um, yeah, not recommended, it's another conversation, but how are you, greens in the fall. How are you cultivating to keep it that clean? Oh yeah, so that's our crew, we just like make them work. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah, uh, people, are, so we're, next year we're gonna try one of these uh, fun, and there's a guy in our neck of the woods that's created a motorized weed weasel. It's gonna be almost like a BCS, but a hand cultivator. Um, we have stone walls everywhere, but have electric fences, we got tons of rocks, so I haven't bought cultivating equipment. Um, and last year our crew was like, oh, you should really buy a cultivating tractor. <laughs> uh, this year the crew is just like up for it. But a couple things go on. Number one is we allow the crop to grow fast. So not like we're waiting for the canopy to constantly fill it. You know, I think that was my experience in New York, is like things were a little sluggish and you're kind of constantly cultivating. Like we want the crop to take off. So we minimize how many cultivations we have to do. And then uh, we cultivate with stubble hoes, wheel hoes, hand tools, and we're doing as frequently as we need to to get the crop established. Um, and sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's a little. I like the work of cultivation. Economically, I sometimes question is the best use of the farm's time, but from a learning perspective, it's great because the crew is out there every day getting a chance to experience different parts of the field. Uh, everything you see here got cultivated twice, but it's the fall, so there's not a lot of weed pressure. Um, and Anything that was special, I'm trying to think of anything was special. This lettuce mix, and I think there was maybe the lettuce heads got some hand cultivation, but otherwise just a couple of those. No problem with deer? Yeah, the deer fence. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. big problem with deer. So electric fencing is a great investment if you have deer. Um, fall radishes, uh, those guys were seeded. So again, talking about this cover crop window, for us, this is uh, seeding on August 30th. You know, those are fall radishes, so rather than cover crop, we put fall radishes down. Uh, this would be a spot where you'd want to, if you didn't have the biomass of the leaf covering things, you'd want to think about trying to sneak in some rye or something like that at the end of the season. Go ahead. Uh, we're speed up a little bit more. There's a, a picture of those uh, lettuce heads that we took an aerial photo of in the middle of June. Um, there you go, keep going ahead, we're going a little faster pace. Oops. Oops. There's that kale, so about a week, yeah. 10 days I think it was, after we saw the, uh, the key here is we're looking, 
And we're not seeing that yellowing in those lower leaves. We're not seeing that stress that I used to see. How do you put nitrogen in Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put nitrogen in We put um, some calcium nitrate amongst other things. But there's a lot of sources you can use organic. The fish emulsion works pretty well. Let's go ahead and go forward. Uh, onions. I've uh, got a couple pictures of onions. These went in really late this year. So this is one of the things I want to stress is that you know our management principles on our farm change every year. This year is darn cold. And it's like, well, what's the point of putting onions out on the ground in, in the soil temperature? I had a thermometer out there. It was not above 50 degrees at any depth through all of April, except for like a half a day when it was really sunny. There was no work through our soils this year. So we put onions in, it's May 7th, which if you know how to grow onions, you want to plant them early, get a lot of top growth so you have a lot of bulbing energy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I put an onion in the ground, it's May 7th that year, it's like, you know, we need to make sure that things are going to accelerate. We got to make sure these aren't going to sit in the ground and go through transplant shock. So we're going to treat that differently than we would in a year where we have, you know, 65 degree soil temperatures in May or something like that. Go ahead and go forward. At some point, we'll see those onions again. Of course, we're using cover crops, we're using high tunnels, and not cover crops, we're using uh, covers, row covers, we're using high tunnels to accelerate growth. This is an experiment of throwing zucchini in the greenhouse, um, which not a lot of growers use in the greenhouse, but I wanted to grow late tomatoes, so I was trying to figure out something that would give me a crop before late, uh, early July transplants. <laughs> so those are zucchini on the 7th of May or somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, it sets it up in a fair corner, May 7th. Um, melons, we are using landscape fabric to warm the soil. This is a way of kind of accelerating the nitrogen release from our biology. Yep. Uh, tomatoes, uh, this was an indication how warm our fall was. Those were harvested from the field this year on November 2nd. Um, and then uh, this is a, a crop picture of our field. So we didn't have a lot of photos that actually showed a lot of things. Um, but this is in early June. We got beans here that have been seeded. Um, we got potatoes that are coming up, and then we got a bed of cilantro that's about ready to be cut. Kind of give you an idea of some of the diversity and, and scale. Um, pumpkins. This is I, I wanted to show. I didn't take a lot of great. I'm not great at taking pictures of ugly things, right? Because a lot of times you're like, I want to put something on Facebook to sell vegetables. Um, but I did make a picture of pumpkin, which you can very easily see that we got powdery mildew and other things going on. Uh, this was at the end of August, so you know our farm isn't full of. Perfection. There's lots of imperfection. Mm -hmm. uh, potatoes in July. Those uh, are red thumb fingerlings. Really nice yielding uh, fingerling variety. All right. So here's a pause again. These are cucumbers. Uh, this is at the end of June. Uh, peppers going really late. Peppers going to the ground. But here is the key, right? So this is winter rye that was as thick as can be, and I was probably late in the game. I probably mowed that maybe 10 days ago. So one of the things that's going to come into our fertility when we can talk about nitrogen is what's happened in that field beforehand. This field that just had trash and been cleaned up is going to have a much different nitrogen need because of the carbon load. So if you're going into a high carbon environment, if you want your crop to take off, you need to make sure you're supplying supplemental nitrogen. Um, what we ended up doing, we had two of those spots. We, we had winter squash in one of them. Those ended up being lettuces. Um, you know, we, we thought of that as a low fertility spot. It wasn't necessarily a low fertility spot on the farm, but from a nitrogen standpoint, it was going to have a low, uh, it was going to have a higher than usual demand. Go ahead. Is the, um, are you measuring that carbon load, or are you just kind of looking at Oh, yeah, just by visual. Yeah, just be like, wow, there's a lot of trash in that field. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, the crew's going to love it if we have to cultivate it. Um, scallions, um, there's a picture in the field, you see pictures of scallions in the, uh, in the middle of July. So we grow pretty much anything and everything that we can make money on, and scallions are really labor intensive. Uh, we bumped our prices up to two fifty a bunch, um, and that's, that allows us to spend time punching scallions. But uh, that's not in the right direction. But there are the scallions in the field; you can see them growing nicely. All right, pause for a second here. This is multi pick winter uh, summer squash, right? Part of my approach is to realize that I don't really know what I'm doing, but I want the plant to be able to like do its best. And the fruiting crops, um, I want them to be producing things that are very good and tasty, but I want them to be producing a lot. And so over the years, our fertility program uh, includes, and we're talking about male and female energies, but some of it right now is this idea that nitrate nitrogen is growth, ammonium nitrogen is reproduction. 
And so, you know, this is where your fishes and some of your ammonia uh, nitrogen sources can really help sustain the fruiting energy. Mm -hmm. We didn't do any foliar sprays, but normally we do. Um, and you can see, you know, abundance coming from this plant. Go ahead. A multi mix good variety. There's a picture of the zucchini. So that's June 3rd. So just an idea of, you know, giving ourselves a new market opportunity selling zucchini to customers they wanted on June 3rd, just like they want the cute numbers. Um, there's a picture of those plants. Sorry, these don't get turned turn around. Go ahead. Make people busy. Um, this is a nice picture from the fall this year. And um, so there's three diseases that we have not conquered, and cucumber downy mildew is one of them. Um, but it gives you a nice picture of you know things that are growing really nicely, and then something that just is completely wiped out. Peppers, I think we're probably done photo-wise. We'll see if there's a few more here that we'll get back to talking. Portuguese kale. <clears throat> there's our farm stand. It's not much, just a little box, some tents up next to it, tomatoes in the tunnel. What is your uh, tillage practice? Uh, thanks so much. That's great for that. I'm gonna turn the lights back on a second. Yeah. So. Um, our tillage practice is again like you know what we think is the best is what we do. I use a tiller, and it's partially because our labor situation is such that we have. Um, find out. Hopefully, there's enough. Yeah, we do. <clears throat> it's a very fast way for us to go from rye to planting. Right. And um, we're by a spader in another five or ten years once we have enough of those rocks out of the fields. But I just, everybody I talked to, my neighbors are like, yeah, I bought a spader and I'm not using it because I didn't realize how rocky our southeast mass soils are. Um, so, yeah, our tillage practices are not based on all the things Dan likes to talk about. They're more based on, <clears throat> like, we have narrow windows of things to get things done. We need to move fast. Right. So we use a flail mower. Uh, that's, I think, my favorite investment on a farm because uh, it allows us to go into a field like that, just like standing, nasty rye, winter weeds, whatever, and just chop it all up really beautifully. Um, and that really creates the surface area. If we're really nervous about all that stuff, we'll put on some digestion type sprays, bring in some microbes, things like that to help accelerate the process. All right. Um, so we got about. A little more than a half hour. And that half hour, what I want to do, um, turn over to page two. We're going to talk about the actual numbers here. And then we're going to talk about nitrogen. And then we're we'll ending the conversation. We're talking a little bit about um, what we're doing besides just nitrogen. All right, so this is a traditional like attempt to develop a, a nitrogen nutrient budget. And it's a worksheet. Um, you got the New England Vegetable Guy. That's just like UMass, all the traditional folks. This is how much pounds of nitrogen an acre you need to grow a crop. Right? On the right hand side are the questions. So is it a type of nitrogen? Do we want a vegetative or a reproductive nitrogen? What are our anticipated yields? Right? If we want something to be really abundant, we might need to provide more nitrogen. If we don't care about abundance, we can probably get by with very little nitrogen. And I, I want to stress that for a moment because um, it's understood very well in the large scale commercial agronomy world, like you're talking about growing how many bushels of corn. Say, well, it depends on how many you know, units of nitrogen that you want to use. Nitrogen is in every single cell. We can't get around that. So it has to come from somewhere. And if you have a, a beautiful functioning system, a lot of it can come from that natural functioning system. If you don't have a beautiful functioning system, you're going to have to get that nitrogen from somewhere. And so, you know, and we're talking about organic matter credits in a sec, but um, there was a study I just came across, and it was Washington State, and they're looking at organic growers growing broccoli, and what they do in, in these studies for yield is they try to find the plateau where yield doesn't increase. And they were working on all these broccoli growers using feather meals or nitrogen source, and most of these guys were putting around 40 pounds, guys and women, 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And so they did a study where they were doing 40 to um, 160 pounds. They wanted to see what the difference was. Um, and in year one, they decided they hadn't hit what they call the plateau, so they actually, year two, did 240 and 320 pounds of nitrogen. This is not a feather meal, this is an actual nitrogen, which is huge. If anybody is, I mean, it's like, it's 11% nitrogen, so you're talking about, you know, putting on a couple thousand pounds of feather meal. 
And they did the study, and it looked a lot at you know what the economic return of this was. But what was clear in the study is that a lot of their organic farmers that were maybe aversive to importing the nitrogen, they were stuck in this zone from a yield perspective. They weren't in the plateau. And you don't necessarily want to be over here where you're spending money and not getting a return, but you want to be somewhere in this spot where your return is giving you. And that's a lot of what, what informs us on our farm is like everything we do on the farm is labor intensive, whether it's prepping the soil, picking rocks, harvesting, and so on and so forth. We don't want fertility to be our limiting factor. And it goes in two ways. We want the yield to be there from a quantity perspective. We want the yield to be there from a quality perspective because we want to make sure we don't have to like peel off a bunch of leaves that look like gnarly. Does that make sense? All right, so anticipated yields, light, medium, or heavy. Uh, what's that crop residue or carbon balance? Um, so that's going to talk a little about that with the rye. What's your or organic matter? So uh, if you're doing a traditional nitrogen budget, you get between 10 and 40 pounds of nitrogen mineralized for every 1% organic matter. So if you have 8% organic matter, you've heavily composted your gardens over the last two decades, you are going to have a lot more mineralization potential than somebody with 2 or 3% organic matter. That mineralization potential is directly tied to temperature and moisture and other things like aeration in your soil. So all of those factors will factor into, do I get a lot of nitrogen for free this year because it's the farm that I'm taking care of, or is it something that's pretty, you know, needs some love? Does that concept make sense? Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, magnesium levels. Neil Kinsey talks about quite eloquently in, in his books on hands-on agronomy that when you get higher levels of magnesium, what it does tends to tighten the soil, tends to reduce oxygen, and through that process maybe shuts down some of the biological activity and also tends to make nitrogen less efficient, the nitrogen uptake, <clears throat> nitrogen utilization. So in all his work working with soybean and corn growers, he's like, well, you want to grow 200 bushels of corn and your magnesium levels are 12%, you can do it with 200 units of nitrogen. But if your magnesium levels are 18%, you've got to use it with 250 units of nitrogen. So I bring that up because if you have soil like ours that's high in, in magnesium, it might mean that you're going to have to do a little more work to get the same result. When you say high, Derek, what percentage? Oh, some of ours are over 20% 20, 20 when we started. And the ones that we've been gypsuming every year for the last six or seven are now down to 12 or 13 percent right in the window we want. Where do you do your testing to send it out to a lab? Yeah, Logan Labs at UMass Amherst. Uh, Logan Labs does a nice mailing analysis, but it overestimates your phosphorus availability, in my opinion. So it doesn't really give you something you can work with. And UMass Amherst does a nice job of looking at like, what's freely available from a phosphorus perspective. Um, the length of crop production, right? Is this a radish? Is it a leak? Right? You're going to have different amounts of growth point on there. And then critically, the timing of the season. So in this scenario, what I did is I took a look at potatoes, which was 180 pounds. I took 50 pounds of nitrogen for our organic matter. The idea was that you know, in my non-irrigated conditions, I'm going to get a little bit less release. Um, I didn't have any legumes preceding that, so I don't get any credit for having a legume cover crop. Um, my crop residue, I had a nice green lush biomass and chickweed and things like that, so I figured I got a little bit of nitrogen out of that when I turned it under. It means I needed 125 pounds of nitrogen to quote unquote grow the potato crop. And here's where we, you know, here's how we got there. We're using some prayers, which is a very inexpensive form of nitrogen. We can get into the ethics of using compost and chicken manure with chickens that don't have any land to run around in, but it's economical from a nitrogen standpoint. It's also for us, we've been using it to build our potassium levels because it's an organic source of potassium that doesn't leach the same way uh, potassium that's in a mineral form is. So that's our primary use. And then we'd be using alfalfa meal, which is a really expensive form of nitrogen, uh, but gives nice results. And some peanut meal, which is a little bit less uh, expensive, but another seed meal type. And then for us, uh, we used to use sodium nitrate, um, which is organically allowable. And this year, we started using calcium nitrate in replacement of sodium nitrate. And I want to stress there, you know, we're not talking about huge amounts, 100 pounds, and that was kind of our standard application for sodium nitrate as well. Small amounts just to kind of like get the system off and running right from the get -go. And then we also were using this year some monoammonium phosphate. <coughs> um, How many square feet are Oh, this is these are all per acre rates, 100 pounds per acre. Yeah, thank you. And so, there's quite a bit there that we're putting down, but we wanted those potatoes to grow and become functional and, and yields. 
The key here is to look at the left-hand column and realize that there's different needs from a crop perspective. If you're growing celery, you're going to need a lot more nitrogen than if you're growing a radish. And as a grower, if you want to be fiscally responsible, environmentally responsible, you're going to treat those fields a little bit differently if you have that capacity. Yeah. yeah. I'm growing more of a medical breakthrough, like food that's therapeutic for people that are sick. Yeah. Could you speak to that a little bit and what kinds of amendments you would use? That's a perfect segue. We're going to be there in about five minutes. Yeah, take the time. Yep. All right, real quick. Anybody want to talk about the use of these conventional inputs? You're good. Yes? Well, I'm just curious about calcium nitrate. Okay. All right. Well, so my thought was we need this sodium and how sustainable is sodium nitrate. The reality is certain crops like beets like sodium, so keep using your channel nitrate. We were using that because we were trying to get that picture of that kale. We are trying to get away from that transplant shock in a cold spring soil environment. And blood meal is uh, probably your best bet from a non-mine source of nitrogen. But if you're going to put the blood meal on, I recommend kind of, if you really want it to work, work well, put it on maybe a week before transplanting or two weeks before transplanting because it still requires a little bit of temperature to get the ball rolling. Um, so last year I sort of said, well, why do I not use conventional sources of nitrogen except for that I've been told that it's evil from the organic world, right? We're not allowed to. Um, so historically, I, one of the reasons I didn't do it is because I thought it was environmentally like not sustainable. And there's truth to that, and there's maybe conversation. So the calcium nitrate, most of it all comes from Norway. Um, I have Norwegian ancestry, so I'm like, you know, supporting the supporting the family blood. No, um, it's natural gas derived limestone treated. And its footprint, its environmental footprint is relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Ammonium sulfate, there's three products we're using. Ammonium sulfate is basically a byproduct of the nylon industry. It's not getting mined for agricultural use right now. And I looked, and I did, I, I, someday I'll write an article about it. But last year I, I looked at, I wanted to use monoammonium phosphate, calcium nitrate, and ammonium sulfate in small quantities to test to see if we could get better quality by putting calcium in available form rather than sodium in available form at this time of transplant. And I did as much, much research as I could do last year in a short period of time, and I found out that from my research, the energy cost of those three fertilizers for our farm was less than an hour of heating oil use for our customer base. So I decided like in the world of things, like, well, I don't use irrigation, I'm not using diesel to run an irrigation pump or various other things. And, you know, this, is a, this is an okay use of energy on our farm. Might not be what we use forever, ever, and ever. Maybe over time we get to have a better system to getting the natural system working. Derek, why the mixture? Would, would one or two of these do the same job? Well, if you take those, if you take those soluble ones out, just just talk about the top ones. Yeah. So the crayers, yeah. primarily we've been using that to build the potassium levels of our fields that were very low in potassium. So if you know anything about the chemistry of potassium, it's weakly bonded as opposed to calcium and magnesium. So if you come into a soil that's got a ton of calcium and magnesium, it's hard to build the potassium levels. So you gotta look for some sort of organic source of potassium that's gonna like stick around. So our approach to Crayers has always been that like we weren't gonna use Crayers like hopefully a decade from now. It was gonna be like a three to five year window to load up our potassium levels. And in fact, this field, potatoes by the way, love potassium for yield perspective. Um, and this field is our field that has the best potassium in it. It's one of the reasons the potatoes were getting planted there. And it's the reason why in years past, you see the history on the back, why we're doing a smaller amount of that prayers than we had historically. And then alfalfa meal, uh, that's kind of me trying to figure out what is a sustainable nitrogen source that I like importing. There's bad things around everywhere, right? Blood meal comes from capos. Soybean meal is still a lot of energy being used in the production. And at some point, I said, well, let's play around with alfalfa meal, and I kind of like it. it um, it's dehydrated, it's dry, it doesn't work really well. It's a really dry year last year. I don't like it for side dressing um, because you get alfalfa everywhere. But if you can afford it, it works really well in high tunnels, high value production zones like that. Um, so that was the reason there. And then peanut meal, well, we had a year where I was like, I needed a little more nitrogen, and I ran out of nitrogen in September, and I wanted to have a little bit more in the, the bank for Abraskas, and I went to a progressive grower, and they didn't have all the things we used, but they had some bags of peanut meal. I was like, oh, I'll buy some bags of peanut meal. Um, and it's just, a, again, a little expense, you know, like soybean meal, it's a, it's a cheap form of organic nitrogen, cheaper form of organic nitrogen. But. So are you planning out your crop planting the year before, or two years before, because you're 
and get things out. Like, like that's yeah, really theoretically. Strange. I think this year I stopped planning the, the field plan like halfway through because I realized that the last few years I was just like plant as you're planting based on like, oh, that rind needs a few more weeks to, to digest. And I realized that having everything mapped out just was not very functional. So no, we, I mean, I know I have, I have very extensive field maps so I can know exactly where things are, we can avoid rotations. A lot of times we're making decisions based on fertility, like a field that has the best potassium might get more potatoes and beets and things that love potassium. A field that has high weeds might get the crops that don't need to be cultivated as much as carrots and things like that. You know, it's a lot of those management. So if you, if you plant alfalfa seed, like green little crop, you know, what's going to be a better idea? Uh, it's too expensive to plant for seed as a green manure crop. You gotta look to Vetch or AC Green Fix or one of those other annuals or crop seeds. Too expensive in that regard. But um, yeah, I mean, I came across there's a guy on, um, in Illinois that does a bunch of organic ag work, and you know, he was first getting going. He couldn't find a lot of good cheap sources of organic, of organic stuff, so he got just non-GMO soybeans, not seed meal, but he just went and planted them, let them sprout, and mowed them all in, and that gave plenty of nitrogen. We have. Um, a neighbor of us, Eva's garden, she does a lot of pea shoot production. She's growing two acres, she's growing tons of peas. And at some point, I looked, I asked them, like, what was their seeding rates? And I just did the math on the pea seed, the nitrogen. I was like, you guys never have to put nitrogen on in your field, ever. Because if you're rotating your pea shoots, you're putting on three times as much nitrogen as I'm putting on in my system because you're seeding things so densely. So there's some opportunities there to think about from a sustainability, holistic standpoint. It's like, if you have a market for pea shoots, and want to make a bunch of money cutting pea shoots, um, she's only growing two acres of veg, but she probably half of that goes through peas in an annual year. What's the turnaround time once you uh, turn in fresh, uh, you know, in terms of getting most benefit? For the release? Yeah. So um, that's a nice segue. The back page, we're talking about the release back. But if you look on the back page, there's like the animal based sources, the plant based sources, the mineral sources. Um, blood meal is going to be your quickest. The fish emulsion is also relatively quick. Um, the crayers, the composted manures, those are going to be much slower. And the seed meals are going to generally going to be a little bit of a slower stage of things. And, you know, if you're really good, you'd probably be putting something like that on in advance of planting so that it's available, but it all depends on the soil temperature. And I think that's the key to understanding this is, is When we're planting, and I got that one page that's radishes seeded at different times, but if you're seeding something in March, rarely anything besides peas, but April, May, June, July, so on and so forth, and your soil temperatures come up, you got a whole lot more biological activity when the soil temperatures are about 60 degrees. Well, if you're seeding a radish here and a radish here, you are going to have to have a different fertility program if you want to have radishes that look nice here, right? And like, what I mean by radishes that look nice is like cotyledons that are full size instead of shrunken down because the plants have had to take the nitrogen out of that, right? Is it, people see those nice, big, thick cotyledons on a radish? You always get those here, right? When the, everything is, is, is functioning, you don't often get those here. So one of the ways that you can do that, you have sort of three options. One is to create a microclimate that allows you to do it. Grow in a high tunnel. We... Um, where we think we're going, we're not there yet, right? John Paul, Mark John Martin Fortier is doing all that stuff with occultation, um, but we don't irrigate, so I've been really hesitant to take the silage tarps out and put them on our fields in the wintertime. So we have silage tarps that we bought, but they're still rolled up. I think where we're going is we're gonna make a financial investment on our farm to, to use landscape fabric on a small scale, probably in the ballpark of a third to half an acre, and we're putting landscape fabric down at this time of year or some other time, and that's going to be where these plantings go into so that we've elevated the soil temperature into a more like May soil temperature at the time that we plant. And then there we put the row cover on to keep the grass and flea beetles away anyways. So we're creating that microclimate using row cover, landscape fabric, occultation, those kind of things. That is the sustainable way, the less sustainable way, of course, is to bring nitrogen in. Right? And you can activate the biological activity even at that temperature with... Well, my experience has been that if you spike soil temperatures and then take anything off that spikes it and just let it be, the temperature drops pretty quickly if it's cold. 
But if you are willing to use row cover at that time of year, and now what it does with that landscape fabric or even plastic or whatever is, is you know, when you take soil temperatures in, in the springtime, this is your soil profile, you get warm sunny days and you get lots of heat building up here, but it's still really cold down here. And the longer, it, it, and again also this makes a difference with sunshine, the longer you get warmth, it starts to build down here. It starts to build a, a deeper profile of soil biology. But then if you can put a row cover piece on there after you plant, then you're gonna be starting in a place where, and I haven't done this, but you know, my guess would say like our kale transplants where we put on a calcium nitrate or we put on a Chilean nitrate, 100 pounds to the acre, small amounts, but soluble nitrogen, we might be able to forego doing that if we use this technique because the biology is starting to mineralize and make nitrogen more available. I was doing some consulting with Julie Ross, I say, you think a row cover is a source of nitrogen? Because what it's doing is it's elevating soil temperature and it's making that system mineralize and function better. Does that make sense? Especially with carrots, carrots so long. Yeah, and, and it, it can have additional benefits of speedy germination, all those kinds of things. Do you have a question? Um, so if you look on those back, there's that list of things, and um, we can talk about that. But if you, if you turn to page three, so this is what I want to talk about what we've done on the farm. At the bottom there is in practice at RIP. If you look at 2017, this is our standard practice last year, a light application of crayers some alfalfa meal, some peanut meal, and then we are supplementing it with some lobster meal, which is a chitin source, and we're using a little bit of the synthetic nitrogen. And that was just because I decided I wanted to play around and see if I got better quality from a root growth. So that picture of that kale that we saw there, that did have calcium nitrate put on, but that's not the only reason you get that root growth. You could do that fine with sodium nitrate, but what you need to do is make sure there's some available calcium so those roots have the energy. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk about the question that he had in a second. What do you find is the most uh, efficient way of distributing these? Are you mixing them together and them at once? Oh, the most efficient them? way is if you're on a scale is to buy a bag of fertilizer that has everything mixed that you want okay. to, or, for, or use custom blends like for trail or line cast drag. What, what do you do? What, what do we do functionally mix? is we do it by hand. Um, and I mean, are you doing each one separately? No, what we do is like this. I'm going to draw a little map. This is, uh, and you know, I'm quick because one, you realize all the things you have to do in the day, and two, you're physically, you know, you're, you're totally energized in March. You don't have to be like put on some muscle, right? But if this is our, our hypothetical vegetable field bed, and our farm is generally 250 feet long, give or take, and we have a bunch of these beds. In the springtime, what we're come out and we're do is we're go out and throw out a bunch of bags of alfalfa here. And this year, the way we did it didn't necessarily make a difference, but we had alfalfa meal here, we had crayers here, and then we were putting on soft rock phosphate. So we had those three things were all put on as separate things, and then we had what we call our mineral mix. And this had everything else. And in the mineral mix that had the peanut meal in it, it had some elemental sulfur, had some trace minerals, all those kinds of things. And real simple, you just walk with the bucket one way, and walk with the bucket the other way, walk with the bucket one way, walk with the bucket the other way. So you never walk with an empty bucket. And for me, uh, it takes a minute, a minute and a half to walk 250 feet, but if you're spreading minerals, about two and a half minutes, so it takes about five minutes to do a round trip. So it'll be about 10 minutes to do a bed. So that's pretty labor intensive. If you're talking about on our farm, more than 200 beds. But you know, it's springtime. It's nice to get exercise. <laughs> just throwing it out of the bucket. Just throwing it out so of the bucket. That's four or five gallon buckets per 250 feet. Yeah, they're not full. Like some of them might be. Like the alfalfa meal was a full bucket. The soft rock phosphate was, we were doing smaller applications, the prayers were half buckets. And then it's mineral mix. Depends on what was in there, but it was about a half bucket. Um, but you know, Steve Murray used to work with me. He bought a, a drop spreader this year. He's like, oh, I got so much more uniformity in my stands. So he's like, it's great. Now I just put the bag and the drop spreader and just drive the tractor around. I kind of don't like to drive the tractor around. I mean, one, we have a kind of beat up tractor, but um, I don't know. It's like long term, maybe I have to change my ways as I get older. Uh, I'm going to be 40 next year, but I still got plenty of years in me. And like it's not necessarily that hard to do, like spread some minerals. 
And it's a different experience. You know, this is the thing I had when I was at Hawthorne Valley is, you know, we were doing all our mechanical cultivation. And so a lot of times you would like interact with the crop really like in a staccato fashion. Like, oh, we transplanted there. And like the crew would come and be like, oh, we're harvesting this. And they did nothing between those two periods. And this like really allows us to be out in the field. And like we'll be out in the field, we might be spreading minerals here. And while we're spreading minerals here, we're like peeking in on the crop here and making sure that nothing's going to, you know, we're really, like we're not having to, I used to, when I first started farming, I did field walks every week. I had to figure out what the heck to do. And I don't ever do field walks anymore. Because I just we just build it into our daily experience. You know. And you are you able to really transfer that to your crew to where they're able to like do it efficiently? Yeah, just as far as like everyone farms differently, definitely on your style. Yeah, we try to find people, I tell people like athletic people that like to be competitive and are athletes. <laughs> um, the way we farm is very physically intensive. Right. And um, for some people, it's not really a good fit. And I also tell people, like, you have to like to work fast. Because, you know, I think of our competition to some degree are these people selling scallions for 10 cents a bunch, where you have, you know, people working migrant fields. I mean, anybody seen those great pictures of, like, a harvest team, like, tackling a cilantro field that's, like, two acres? Like, the speed that they're working at, there's incredible efficiency. So on our farm, it's like, we're inefficient because we're harvesting 20 different things a day. But when we get to the task at hand, you need to be as efficient and on point as possible. So, you know, we have bunching standards. Depending on what level of crew we have, we will push things where we need to push it. So, for example, like, who times themselves bunching parsley? Right? You know, for me to do 40 bunches of parsley, if the field is in good shape, you're doing six to eight bunches per minute. So, you know, in that ballpark, 40 bunches should be about a six to eight minute task. You have a minute or two to walk. That's the time it takes to do that task. I won't ask our crew to harvest parsley at that speed, but they can build up to it. And I have harvest standards that, that I think we need to be at to be efficient when we're doing things, um, because that's what we do most of our farm is harvest. And a lot of the things that we do are not things that we can get on a small scale super mechanized with. Like, what are you going to do to make parsley bunching more efficient? Have really good quality, so you don't have to pick out yellow leaves. And be mechanically fast. Like we do a lot of work with teaching people the actual mechanics of rubber banding and that kind of stuff. Um, before you move on, um, do you broadcast like into your pathways when you spread your emails? You know, yeah, a lot of times. Sometimes we build beds, and and then we can target it. Yeah. But a lot of times I don't have permanent beds, so I kind of like the idea of things getting broadcast. It's less efficient. Mm -hmm. um, we might play around next year with doing some banding of. There's some really good research banding phosphorus with some ammonium and things like that. The idea behind MAP is maybe to bond MAP and soft rock phosphate together, keep them in a band, so you're creating a little bit of acidity that helps to create that release from the soft rock. But for the most part, we just broadcast things because we want the roots to go and get, not just be in a small space. And um, our wheel tracks, because we're not cultivating with a tire, our wheel tracks aren't crazy compact, you know. What do you do for like the uh, downy mildew or any uh, fungi activity? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the first page of this. Uh, I like to say that the downy mildew classification of fungi, which are not fungi, they're oomocytes. I have not conquered them in the least. Um, if somebody has, and they want to tell me their secret, uh, when Jerry Burnett is around, he had some good research on cucumber downy mildew in the greenhouse using some of his biologicals and oils. But the three products, so you know, if you know your mildews, you've got cucumber downy mildew, you got basil downy mildew, you got lettuce downy mildew, those are the three that are probably most prevalent in New England right now. And I was never keen to spray a bunch of essential oils on my basil leaves. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I can see it from a cucumber management perspective, but this one is the one that we've historically struggled with the most. Um, and genetics have done a good job with the lettuce mildews. There's a lot of, much of downy mildew resistant lettuce varieties. And there's a new variety of pickling cucumbers that Harris released. It's going to be treated this year called Citadel. They're used in Michigan. There are a few varieties that have better disease resistance for cucumbers, but we're still away from it. And basil, I mean, Eleanor is a, a very intermediate resistance. Um, and 
I, yeah, other diseases, most years we see functional improvement based on our fertility program. Yeah. Um, but the oocytes, the way they work is they trick the guard cells to let them into the cell and then they kill things and they shut down the communication. And I have it from a fertility perspective, been able to create resistance. Yeah. How about a microbiome perspective? I don't hear you talk about that much. Do you consider that in things like that or in your whole farm management? Like from a, like biology of the leaf and those kind of things? Or you know, well, just cultivating a healthier microbiome in general in the soil and then for the plants your access minerals and nutrients and all that. Yeah, you know, I guess my approach is that if we grow the plant really healthy, it's going to hopefully do that for us in terms of creating a lot of root exudates. You know, and, and, and you know, like what well, you didn't see in that photo, a lot of times what we're looking at. Um, we we'll just pause and look at that kale photo for again because it's a nice way to, to demonstrate it. Is you know when we start to look here over time, what you will see is you'll see that the tips will always be bright and shiny and free of aggregation. But a lot of times when we're digging up roots, and I dig up roots, you know, every day of the week in the springtime, constantly looking at things. What I want to see is aggregation on the roots that have been there for a day or two as a good understanding that that's where the plants actually put things out to the root system. And, um, you know, the approach is, going back to kind of the medicinal grade, it's like, the other thing we're doing is some deep tillage to help give ourselves better biology at depth. You can do that with mulching to some degree as well, or things like that. But if this is our root system for our plant, and here in this case we've got kale, seated on three rows, I want the roots to, to colonize this space quickly, and then I want them to be able to feed that space as well as I can. What I don't do, which most people would think about from a microbiome perspective, is keep the moisture level there. And I don't do it because I've decided it's not functionally something I want to invest my time in. Um, does it make a difference? Absolutely. And could you grow a better crop? Absolutely. Um, the crop quality where we suffer on, I'm trying to think, well, celery, you don't get great yields in a really dry summer with a celery crop. But um, a lot of our crops, the, the plant quality is still quite excellent. The yields are still there. Um, you know, we go through dry periods and we, we sustain things. But there is a shutdown of biology in this zone, but there is moisture here, so the plant's doing things in that zone. Um, I'm curious what you see in terms of the organic matter in the soil. Well, ours, we haven't done any great of this or that. Ours are tend to be between 4 and 6%, depending on how much labile, kind of fast turnover organic matter we have in terms of biomass. Um, and that's sort of the background levels, a little higher, because we tend to put a lot of trash back in the fields. Um, and, you know, compost is a beautiful thing for that aspect, I think. You know, I don't think of compost so much. If you put it on from a nutrient perspective, you're often overloading the system. Which isn't necessarily bad to do it. The reason we haven't used compost on our farm is the map of southeastern Massachusetts. I don't have any good compost producers in my area. I have, commercially, I have A1 in Middleborough that produces a waste from you know municipal parts of Boston. Some people like it, but it's also got uh, cranberry waste. It's high in nitrogen, grows a great crop, but then you're also bringing in whatever chemical residues are present on those cranberries. So I decided I didn't really want to use that. I tried uh, using um, the, the place in, in Rhode Island, Casella's, and because uh, Chuck Curry at Freedom Food Farm had good results with them, and the year that we tried it, I said, oh, maybe we're going to start bringing compost in because it's affordable. It tied up nitrogen. It just wasn't finished where it needed to be for me. Uh, so nice source. So we've always been in the approach of, you know, we build our organic matter, hopefully, in, in present. And, you know, John Kemp, who's been at these conferences for a long time, he's talked about that one of the ways to is this carbon induction is if you can get fat coming out of the root systems, that's where you get fungal digestion, and that's how you can start to build organic matter while you still grow a cash crop. We haven't, there's some crops that we grow that are glossy and probably doing a great job, but it's not like we're at 8% organic matter without using cover crops. Uh, we do aerate the soil with tillage. Is there any studies done that try to sort some of those crops that we grow using microclimates? Any relationship here? Uh, yes and no. I mean, that's we're in a coastal environment where we often are fogged in on a regular basis. But say downy mildew, um, there, a lot of the research is done in Florida, University of Florida. 
And they showed that, you know, even in a greenhouse environment where they can control for things, they often see colonization on seedlings in the three to seven day, seven to ten day window. So that's what's unique about the downy mildews is, you know, most of the diseases take on the things that are dead. And just like late blight, which is another one of those oomocytes, those tend to focus on things that are still alive and healthy. Um, how often do you soil test and uh, which soil test do you use? Yeah. All right. So then I want to end the, the, the conversation there. So uh, I use soil tests as a tool. So anytime I want information to make a smart decision, I do a soil test. Typically, that's every year. Sometimes it's every 18 months. Sometimes it's every six months. So I pulled soil samples in the spring this year. I'm going to pull soil samples next week because I want to make some decisions with our high tunnels because um, I have one of my high tunnels has the plastic off because we lost part of it in a windstorm. And I'm trying to make a decision whether I want to keep the plastic off or want to put it back on and try and grow a crop. So um, we use Logan Labs as a Malik analysis. gives you, I think, a, as a bank account. And then, as I mentioned, we use UMass, which is a modified board. It's a weaker acid. gives you a better idea of your phosphorus availability. The Logan Labs test... In, in our soils, where we had cows on that farm until the 80s, there's a lot of ambient phosphorus locked up with iron and other compounds in the ground. So our Logan Labs tests show phosphorus through the roof, but yet when I do tests, I still see, and I talk about what doing tests is, I still see response from that phosphorus. So a lot of times what we do is we take soil tests, right, a piece of information, do the same thing in the fields. How many samples per acre do you have? Uh, it depends on if it's uniform, but like our, we normally do it by the field. So our largest field is three acres, and we do one set of samples for that entire field. We're just avoid hot pockets, right? If we dumped a bunch of whatever here, we're not going to sample out of that. Um, so before we talk about what all we're going to do, you can get carried away, but I'd say probably in an average year, we do about six to eight trials that are nowhere near scientific. This is a great one to do, spring cabbage. We grow farao, everybody grows farao, we know how delicious cabbage can be. And we do two rows, so this is a single bag, so this is one row, two rows, and we do them typically on 18 inch spaces. So we're not doing anything magical, right? Is nitrogen the limiting factor on your farm? Take your beds at you know, some sort of elevated rate. Try blood meal in this row, or you can do you know, the whole bed and blood meal at 200 pounds per acre. Blood meal is about, uh, what is it, 12%? Something like that, so it's about 24 units of nitrogen. Don't do it on that side and see what happens. I use that as illustration, but we did that exact test, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago. Except that we didn't do the whole field, I just did like one quadrant. So this one row, it's all planted the same day. We were harvesting those farao heads about six days earlier than everything else. Um, so from a marketing standpoint, maybe that has a benefit. Were those heads that much better than these? We actually saw some iron release. And I think that there's a, a better coloration of leaf thickness to those guys than the ones that didn't get that blood. So um, what I encourage, you know, kind of going back to that soil testing, like with phosphorus, springtime phosphorus tends to be a limiting factor in cold soils. And, you know, it's nice if you're using bone char or bone meal, in our case, monoammonium phosphate or soft rock phosphate, is to do some tests on your farm or, or fish emulsion where you do something differently than there. It's not going to be scientifically proven anything, but it'll help give you an understanding, hey, that made a difference. Hey, that didn't make a difference. Last year um, in the greenhouse, we were, so this is, so we were a year into our experiment with using conventional fertilizers. And part of the reason once I decided to do it is I had some meadow top dress from Lancaster Ag that I bought from my landowner because I wanted to see if he wanted to start fertilizing his hay fields because his hay fields were tired. But it was like three or four years ago. I was in the barn and I'd been sitting there and I said, well, you know what? I'm not going to allow myself to use conventional fertilizers. So I'm just going to go and put some meadow top dress on this half of a bed, this was a 44 foot bed, and this was seeded in arugula, and this was seeded in November, I forget the exact date. And I didn't put it on that half. Well, it was a warm fall last year, and surprise, surprise, this arugula was ready to harvest about seven to 10 days earlier, maybe even more so, so when we first cut the arugula, we cut here, we cut here. By the time we made those two cuts, those two weeks, then we had beautiful arugula over here, 
and then our regrowth will be able to do it. So we're able to stagger our harvest from a single planting date just by using a fertility management sample. So um, that allowed us to say, hey, you know, and we were really, the, the growth and the um, quality, we're constantly assessing quality. We don't use the fancy tools, we will when Dan has them, but I, you know, I didn't use a refractometer much this summer because we're too busy. I'm constantly assessing quality by eating things in the field, asking my customers I know on a regular basis, and I, I you know, over time, like we had a couple things that didn't hit the mark this year, we had a couple things that were just great, but are constantly, that's why I think our workshop that's been with us for eight years, I don't want her to ever leave because she's there every week, and I can constantly be like, so how was last week's report? And she will tell me point blank that she's been with us as a CSA member from the very get-go, and she's had our highs and our lows, and she will give us a really honest assessment. A lot of times our customers, they've had just junk everywhere else, so, you know, they're just like, it's fresh. <laughs> like, it tastes great. All right, we're going to run over just a couple minutes to address the important question in the room. So from a quality perspective, my thought is that okay, if you push nitrogen and you're putting all these other things in and your quality suffers, then you know we're not so interested. And that can happen. And it's kind of a nice experience to trial and find out what that mark is. When you're bringing nitrogen into the crop, that nitrate when it comes into the crop tends to promote like a watery growth, expansive growth, it's not really compact. And so you have to kind of like rein that in. And um, the wine growers, uh, you know, there's some fancy nitrogens out there, like amino acid plant-based nitrogens, they're liquids, they're really expensive. And I know there's wine growers in Europe that are like, you know, we don't see certain disease problems when we're using this form of nitrogen as opposed to the nitrates and things like that. So there's a lot of research that could be done down the road. But what I think that sometimes we forget is a lot of times we, we say, you know, NPK, and you put all this nitrogen on and get growth, and we forget about everything else. And I think that's the often mistake that, that if we start to just vilify nitrogen, nitrogen at its core, right, is a constituent in so many important plant molecules. Chlorophyll has nitrogen in it. Every single cell in the DNA has nitrogen in it. A lot of the flavor compounds, they have nitrogen in it. What we want to avoid are, you know, these nitrates, right, in excess. And Hugh Lovell's done some really nice writing. I have a couple of his books up here um, talking about the biochemical sequence. But you know, here this idea, so I just did my version of it. Well, potassium is a really key to bulking a crop of. If you have really low potassium levels, then you're limiting your growth potential. So if you put a bunch of extra nitrogen on, and the nitrogen, is, what, what's hard with nitrogen is plants aren't really good at governing how much nitrogen comes in. So if you have too much nitrogen in the, the plant, you're gonna just take it up. They're like, we think we need this. They don't talk up to there saying, like, well, we can't grow much more. And they say, well, I think we need this. Let's just keep, you know, shoveling it in. So you need adequate potassium to build the, the bulk if you're going to have that growth element there. That's one. Calcium is going to be in every single cell. It's going to help create cell walls. It's going to help create the, the functional like, communication between cells. And if you have low calcium levels, I don't care what you're doing, you're not going to get the quality. I don't like to be quite so dramatic in comment, but I think I'm willing to make that comment. You can assay how well you're doing with calcium by looking at root systems. Calcium is not remobilized. So going back to our um, our little diagram over here of our kale plants, if there's calcium here, it does nothing for root systems down here because calcium comes up through the plant through that process of respiration. So the calcium here is not going to get shunted down to the root system. Your calcium in your roots comes from the root tip where it's actually being brought into the plant. So to build cells at that spot, you need calcium. So to build thick roots, pearly white roots, you need more of that. And you can actually get a good understanding of your calcium levels just by digging up root systems and looking at it and saying, do we see pearly white or do we see off-color depth? Does that make sense? All right, so you need absolutely to focus on calcium, bar none. So you need phosphorus. There's the, the, the there we got KR. We need phosphorus for the energy. That's the battery system for your plant. And oftentimes in the springtime, if you're not getting adequate phosphorus, it is the limiting factor. 
You need plant, if they're going to grow these root systems, you need energy to grow roots. That's where the plants are putting energy in during that early stage of things. And then the three things, you know, that I think are, are so key to quality when you have concerns around nitrates from a mineral perspective is boron to make sure that calcium is moving, because that gets forgotten about too often. And then it's molybdenum. Typically our soils have abundant iron, but molybdenum is the key to the nitrate reductase enzyme. So when the nitrate goes into the crop, it has to get broken apart. The nitrate reductase enzyme does that, and if you don't have molybdenum, sometimes there's a few other things that can substitute for it, but for the most part, you need molybdenum to do that. And anytime that I'm going to push nitrogen, and I get concerned about nitrates, I'm going to address this with some sort of fertility protocol. For me, it's sodium molybdate, either foliar sprayed or applied to the soil. And that means in a greenhouse environment in the wintertime where I'm concerned about high nitrates, because <laughs> light is a limiting factor in, the, in, in February and spinach gets high in nitrates, we're going to include that in our fertility program. Are you looking at your soil test for molybdenum levels as well, or are you just, you're just actually watching the plants here and looking at roots and stuff? No, we take more of like, a, we think what's going to happen is going to happen. And we can take some like emergency, we've done this, like we had some aphid pressure one year, and I was like, that's probably a good indication of nitrates. Let's go do a foliar spray, which we did with Epsom salts and iron and little bit of things like that, and we were able to, like, aphids, I don't know where they went, but we were able to start cutting lettuce a couple weeks after that. I'm not saying that all aphids will ever go away with molybdenum, but there might be something to it. Um, our approach is to try to map out what we think is going to happen at the beginning of the season, plan accordingly. So if we put boron on, spray it out over the fields everywhere in the springtime, but then to have the tools in the barn so that if we need to make a reaction, we can make a reaction. And then it's just all bets are off. If it's August, you're like, well, if we have time to make that decision. A lot of times it's like, I know what I should be doing, but I should also be picking tomatoes. So we're going to, you know, it's, you're making all those micro -carbon. What's your favorite source for getting these materials? For molybdenum, I like the mine functional sodium molybdate as opposed to using kelp and things like that because I want a lot of it. And whenever I put something in there that tends to leach or move, like the boron or the sodium molybdate, I always marry it with carbon. We use liquid humic acids in our backpacks our tanks, but I want those things that I'm going to put on and spend money on, I want them to stick around. And organic, that's really my organic matter, it helps sponge all that up. So then the other two big things when we're looking at balancing nitrogen are sulfur and copper, and really you can just go on and on, but salt is a really key to protein development. And atmospherically we get less sulfur than we used to from the smokestacks of the Ohio River Valley. And so I think it's the thing that often gets forgotten about. We on our farm are putting elemental sulfur on every year, small amounts, like 20 pounds to the acre. That elemental sulfur requires soil biology to release, so it's not going to be available um, the minute you put it on. Sometimes it might not be available at all that season. It's building your bank account. And then we use some sulfur mag or some gypsum calcium sulfate to provide some soluble sources of calcium in the spring the sulfur in the springtime. And then the final one, copper, was well, copper plays a big role in lignification, and that's the structural and strength. It also plays a big role in some flavor profiles. But anytime you're pushing nitrogen, right, you're that watery growth, you want to kind of balance that out to make sure that we still have strength to it. So lodge, great growth, talking about lodging, you know, crops that are falling over in the wind or things like that. Um, we want to make sure it's there. I, we tried those peppers this year for the first time in like six or seven years. Um, just because I was like, hey, let's start trellising peppers here. Um, so who trellises peppers here? And who doesn't trellis peppers here? So um, there's pros and cons to doing it either way, but when I did it, then, yeah, so what we did, we bought metal tea steaks. We're halfway through our investment. We'll buy another round of them next year, four foot tea steaks. And uh, when I was talking to Steve, he's like, oh, what have you done in the past? I'm like, oh, we haven't trellised them. Most of the time, they stand up straight. Like, if they have the strength of the plant, they're going to stand up straight. But, you know, we have like hurricane. The reason we decided to start trellising is because we have Jose or things like that for like four days and 40 mile per hour winds. And we want to have peppers into the late season. So, yeah, I might as well spend the money and start trellising. But we can do a lot when we think about fertility to, to 
if we isolate something, can focus on something, to remember that nothing is in the vacuum. And if we, in order we want to pursue quality, it has to be done in a complementary fashion. And the biological system, so organic matter is really good, the plants are really good at, at keeping that all going, but sometimes you need something to jumpstart the, the, the season. Final questions? I'm going to apparently be doing a fireside chat if you want to. Getting the uh, we use Lancaster Ag through Progressive Grower because Progressive Grower backhauls for them and uh, they're affordable. Uh, copper sulfate, just buy a 50 pound bag. But you know, if you're small scale, it's just great to get it mixed for you rather than having to do all that stuff yourself. I kind of like to mix it because it allows us to. We have different fields that are in different years of maturity, so I can. You know, some fields test really well in copper now, so I don't have to put copper on, but other fields are in the earlier stages. Um, yeah, uh, Progressive Grower has really good prices on anything in that world of things. Sometimes, like the really esoteric things, like sodium lipate or cobalt sulfate, it's like Amazon, you know, like going online to find like the greenhouse grower supplier. Like last year, and I don't know, it'd be fun to like actually get an assay to figure out if what I think is sodium molybdate at 39% molybdenum actually is. Like last year, it used to be 50 bucks a pound, and somewhere I found it for $20 a pound. So I was like, okay, I might as well save my dollars there. I've heard you talk about zinc for like early plant growth, but I didn't know if there's any seasonality to that. Or yeah, zinc, and that's where it goes on and on and so forth, right? There's cobalt, zinc, and maggie. Zinc plays a big role in a lot of the enzymatic development of proteins and plants. And we do zinc in a starter fertilizer almost always. Um, just a small amount. And there's a couple of products, liquid products out there that if you want to just make life easier, I'm sure Dan probably sells some random things nowadays through the uh, BFA, but we've used the Biomin, which is an organically OMRI approved uh, trace mineral fertilizer. They have a micronutrient blend that has zinc sulfate in it, has copper, boron, all those things. And I use that as my backstop. Like, if you don't want to get into a bunch of chemistry, but want to put a couple ounces of all these things in, in a soluble form, it's a nice way just to like bring it in. If you could put, somebody asked about the transplant drench, you could put that into a transplant drench, it'd be a way to do that. We often, you know, a lot of the um, minerals, so calcium is key because it's building structure of the plant, but a lot of the trace minerals are constantly being reused in their enzymatic activities. So, you know, one way to do this efficiently is just to <coughs> spray your greenhouse before you transplant and bring some of these minerals into that. Um, zinc, there's really good research on zinc, for example, with zinc fertilization and the carryover effect of the seed. That's a lot of research going on in corn, in like New York State, that kind of stuff. So seed quality can make a huge difference in this as well. And I just assumed that our seed quality is not good when I get started. Um, we had, I, I'll leave that as the final note, Dan's been harping on that for the longest time. We grow ambrosia sweet corn from Fedco, it's really tasty sweet corn. And uh, this year, I opened, last year the crop wasn't that good, and I went into my office. And I realized I had corn from two years ago, and didn't think much of it. But this year, I'm like, well, I might as well seed them and see if they're still viable. And the day we pulled those corn seeds out, the kernels from the 2015 purchase were like thick, and they weren't shriveled, and they looked pretty good. And the ones from 2016 were not as good. So I was like, well, let's do this trial and test, just like Dan likes to say. We did that trial and test. And the vigor in the seedling was noticeable difference, and the vigor, we traded it all, right over through the field. Everything made a difference. The problem is you don't know when you're buying something whether you're going to get a nice big thick seed or something that doesn't happen. So uh, this information here will also get posted on my website. Um, I'm going to do an all-day workshop at NOPA at the Winter Conference looking at minerals for this season, so not so much nitrogen, but talking about a lot of these and really getting a, a handle on the, the seasonality of it. Uh, and I mentioned I'm going to do a lettuce workshop for anybody who wants to get into lettuce in February. But I'll be around. Thanks for sticking out. <laughs>